Hi friends, today we're going to be taking a look at the second single off my upcoming record, Possibility. And I thought, what better day to do it than a dark, gloomy, overcast day. Perfect. So let's just get right into it. The first track to talk about here is probably the most important in my mind, which is this track right here named Paul Stretch. And that is because it is a capture from a plugin called Paul Stretch, which I will bring up right here. Um, Paul Stretch is this really interesting, weird, uh, magical plugin that got really famous uh, a few years ago maybe 10 years ago, uh, when someone took a Justin Bieber track and fed it through it and made it ambient or 10 minutes long or something like that. Um, and since that, the plugin has been repackaged and, and put back out because it kind of was hard to find. And I had been using a version of it on Norns. Um, there was a really cool uh, script for that. But it's back out there and you can get it and it's a lot of fun to play with. But the thing about Paul Stretch that I love so much is that um, I like making my own textures and I like making the textures of the track within the track, if that makes sense. So what I like to do is I like to go through and kind of uh, play through the track, compose the track, and then bounce that down into a stereo file and import that file into Paul Stretch. And then from that, I will then create a really kind of ethereal, ambient, haunting, angelic type of atmosphere to then put under the track. So it's made of its own self but completely transformed. And because I do so much with virtual instruments and organic instruments, I really think that this is a fun way to incorporate mm, that human element that I kind of am always after. So uh, with this, uh, Paul Stretch works best in my opinion if you kind of just live capture the performance. So in, an, in essence, there's no possible way for me to recreate the performance that I captured that is in this track. So in a way, it's a documentation of something that happened once that way and will never happen again. So I feel like that's really kind of special. Um, but the Paul Stretch track is the thing that starts us off. It gives you this like wind and kind of like haunting and a little spooky, but at the same time uplifting. Um, and if you're listening in headphones, you can see how there's some binaural stuff happening there. Um, and I just love it because it's this great drone. Um, and then I got to tack on it one of my favorite reverb plugins and uh, if you can see this over here, I have a ton of reverb plugins. I really love reverb. I have a ton of reverb pedals. It's one of my most favorite effects. Um, so for this, I'm using the Eventide Black Hole. Um, looks like a preset started as Dreamscape and then I might have adjusted it from there, or I may not have um, because I don't like to spend too much time overthinking things like that. If it sounds good, it sounds good. Um, and that sounded good to me. So uh, you can see that the Paul Stretch performance was edited and that's because I sat there probably for 30 minutes just kind of playing through this thing and then I went through and I cherry picked pieces of the performance that I liked and stitched it together. So that is our first bit and while we're here we can take a look at our um, sound effects which I always like to use and they're really really low. I'll bring them up but there's some rain and some birds and I like to go through and almost, um, I like to ride the uh, volume of it as the track goes so that the pieces kind of come in and out um, and it feels sort of like it's alive. So even if your brain isn't registering the actual sound, it's registering that there is a sound there and that is of air and nature and wind and, and you know natural elements that your ear is used to hearing. And I think it just does something kind of fun. It, it, it makes you feel like you're familiar with the piece as you're hearing it. Um, so that's why I like to use sound effects. I think it helps make the mood a little bit more. 
and it just adds some depth to it. You don't have to do a lot. You don't have to overdo it. Um, like there, you just saw it was only two layers and that's pretty much all you need. Um, but stepping back to Paul Stretch for one second, um, I can see here that the performance was actually from the modular rig. So it seems as though I maybe took a modular performance and threw it in there and then scrubbed through it. Okay, so still with me? Let's scroll up a little bit to some of the other acoustic organic elements, analog elements. Um, and you'll see there's a lot of tracks in here and that's because I did uh, four, three different tracks on the record within the same session, um, which I guess is a testament to flow state. Uh, just kind of finding a groove and being in it, I sometimes will work really fast um, and then go back and edit later. And that's just how it works for me. It may not work for you that way, um, but that's what I've been doing lately, and it's been nice. Um, so let's go back to, where are we? Here we are. You see, I also called the track Possible and changed it to Possibility later on. First thing to take a look at here are two memory mode tracks, and let's see what they're doing for a moment. Okay, so we have a couple of different performances happening here. So I'll solo this one out for a minute. To be honest with you, I don't even really remember doing that, but it's there, so I guess I did. Um, and the chain for this um, is this cool UAD Chandler limiter curve bender plugin. Um, I saw it on a video online and I decided to try it and I freaking love the thing. So if you got UAD type of stuff where you can use it on your computer, highly recommend checking that thing out because it just sounds awesome. Um, but then of course I have my trusty Fab Filter Pro Q on the end there, just scooping off some of the bottom end. The more low end you can get rid of within reason, the more volume that you can get out of your track because you can have more headroom because you don't have that muddiness happening and the less confused your bottom end will be. Um, I'm sure people will disagree with me on that, but that's what I like to do. Uh, and then I get to use this cool plugin from Baby Audio, which is Crystalline. Um, when it came out, I got it immediately and I've been using it ever since. It's just a really great plugin. I love the design of it. It looks so squishy and it just has a super cool ducker in it, which cleans up your mix as well. You don't get this muddy reverb. And what a ducker does is it ducks the reverb when it sees incoming signal. So you're getting these little dips in it and it's making room for the incoming signal. So your dry signal and it's allowing the tail to kind of come afterwards, which has this really cool effect and you can dial it way up or you can be subtle with it. And I'm being quite subtle with it there. Um, and then the final piece is this plugin that I got a long time ago and I still use it and nobody really asked me about it. It's uh, Brower Motion from Waves. It's, uh, there are plugins that do things like this. It's essentially an auto panner, um, but it does it with proximity. So as you get further away, the volume dips is essentially the magic behind what is happening there. But you can adjust the speed, you can adjust the depth, you can adjust the distance. Um, like I said, there's a ton of plugins out there that do that now, including some free ones. Um, but this one is just my preference. I like it. It does it in a way that feels really severe sometimes. And so I stick with it. Um, and then we'll take a look at this other track here, which just sounds to me like I am 
arpeggiating through some chords on the memory moog and you can hear the tooting of the mem memory moog is a little out sometimes i'll turn it on and i'll just start performing with it right away and not let it warm up uh, hopefully i'm not harming it by doing that but i like it when it's a little cold and and the tuning's a little out versus being a little more warmer and gooier um, and again using the same chandler Q3 and uh, Crystalline in a slightly different way than the other one. So you put them together and you get this kind of weird carousel of arpeggiations and sparkles and vibe and all that. Um, so there you have it. Those are the two synths, which are the memory mode, which sit right to my left. And then we walk in with the big baddie, the Mini Moog. I love this thing so much. This will be a forever synth for me. Oh, yeah, it's just huge. And the glide on it is so drunk and the tuning can get so gnarly and just fight against itself. And I love the thing, but it can also sing. In this case, I'm using it as a deep growl because it's kind of an angry, moody, menacing beast behind a door that felt like it needed to be let out. Um, and there's this great API strip from uh, UAD as well, which is uh, I'm, I'm using specifically in it, there's a Mike Dean preset called Look at This Bass um, and uh, filtering out quite a bit there. Like everything under 100K is just gone. Um, and then I'm doing the same with the Pro Q3, just giving a little dip, making some room in the low end for it. Um, but I really like what happens when you use the mic input instead of the instrument input for it. it gets this hair on it really cool um, so the synths all together those three sound like this and if we add in paw stretch So like right away with just those few elements, you have tension, drama, intensity, spookiness. It's all kind of happening within there. Um, and that's, I mean, that's kind of, that's it. Those are the bones of the track. That's, that's really it is just these few elements. And that's how I like to approach the production sometimes is just, doing a lot with as little as possible. Um, I know, he says, as he then walks you through a bunch of other tracks that he used. <laughs> um, so let's keep working our way up. Uh, from here, we enter the land of Spitfire. Um, so Spitfire has been fraught with controversy over the last few years, and maybe still is. Uh, but the thing is, is I really love their products and their plugins and they make really high quality stuff um, so it's complicated uh, to say the least but I'm going to lean in right now and just show you what I use because this is what I used um, so the main piano that is doing kind of the hits underneath the bass is this sort of tacky delicate felt from the pool project which is this release that they did with oliver patrice weeder i hope i'm saying his last name right um I, there are a lot of felt plugins out there uh, a lot of felt piano plugins out there and this one just speaks to me uh and it worked in this track uh because you can kind of adjust the pedal volume the key release the verb that you're using but as you'll see is totally dead on this and i'm using the valhalla room plugin um, just because sometimes i like to be a little different um, so it would be nice to use the reverb that was built in but 
I just like the way this Valhalla sounds. Um, and with the felt like this, that attack is what I was really after, and I'll show you why. Um, I'm after that attack because it pairs with this. The attack on this sound that you're listening to right here is sort of <laughs> what I started dreaming about for a long time. This sound is coming from a plugin from Spitfire and Oliver Arnold's, and it is Stratus. I've used it on countless recordings that I've done. I've used it with their piano algorithm, and I've used it with their synth algorithm. When I found out that the synth algorithm was actually based on Olifer's PS3100, I then kind of went on this wild goose chase to find a Korg PS3100. Turns out they're prohibitively expensive and rather rare. Um, they're big, they're heavy, but I found one and I couldn't help myself. So we have over here the Korg PS3100. And I'll show you a little setup of how I got to approximate the sound that I was using on the record so that I can now reproduce it anywhere, anytime. And then if you add in the stereo space echoes, you get that effect. Okay, well, we're back looking at this. You can see that the Stratus plugin is our main rhythm. And it's just chugging along. And those piano hits are off in time from the rhythm of it. And that is intentional. And they're on ups, and sometimes they're on downs, and sometimes they're rushing it, sometimes they're behind. So I don't do a lot of MIDI editing. I try not to. I don't like it. I think that by having stuff that's a little imperfect, it allows it to breathe. Uh, okay, I could go on and on about the Stratus plugin and about the Korg PS3100. I mean, I love the damn thing, and I'm so fortunate to have it. You don't have to run out and get one. If you want to have that sound, you can buy the plugin. Or I just saw today that you can go to Cherry Audio and get the Korg PS3300, which was the mama of all synths um, for the Korg lineup in the 70s. Uh, all right. So. Let's move on. We're moving up a little bit here. As you'll see, I'm also a big fan of Olifer's strings and I'm using here their evolutions. And what's fun about the evolutions is that it's kind of a pegboard. If you've never seen it or you've never used it before, what the pegboard does is it's separated here into colors and those different colors represent different articulations. So you can take those different articulations and assign them to different keys different notes. So if you know what key you're playing in, you know what scale you're playing in, you know kind of what you're going to be playing, you can arrange and compose those pegs in the pegboard to be a performative tool. And that's exactly what I did with this, um, which starts just very so, so soft and so wavering. I love using the evolutions like this because it feels so cinematic and right away you can have a whole piece with just that. You don't need anything else. Uh, if you are a talented uh, keys player or uh, string orchestrator or arranger, that's all you need. I am neither of those things. So having something that has the emotion uh, come through from here to there is such a valuable asset to me. And this tool does that 
so well. Um, also, I remember seeing a video of Hans Zimmer talking about how he wanted the sound of razor blades on strings for The Dark Knight. Um, I think it was The Dark Knight. And I'd never been able to get that out of my head. And I kind of constantly search for things that sound like that to me. Um, and so when I find instruments that do that, I kind of run with it. So the, the key to the string performances and, and everything uh, orchestral like this is uh, using a expression tool. So in my case, I'm using faders to deal with dynamics and expression. And I'll get into that maybe in a different video. But then we go up to the top here, and this is my sort of secret weapon, also from Spitfire. It's called Heirloom, and it's a tubax. And I love this thing so much. It's been used on intention, intention to when the trees sleep, um, multiple tracks on this record coming up. And here it is now on Possibility. It's this really reminds me of Robin Pecknold and the Westerlies for Fleet Foxes. And when you pair it together with the strings, you get this really interesting push-pull grating, almost. And those elements kind of fly off in the top, to me. They're like runaway balloons, almost. And the thing that grounds it all is the piano. And the PS3100 in Stratus. Of course, you bring in the memory Moog, the mini Moog, and things start getting really intense. But then you put that Paul stretch underneath it, and the whole picture starts coming together. Kind of like a Polaroid, you now have this dark, haunting soundscape. And that, my friends, is a little insight into possibility. If you haven't had a chance to check it out, please do.